Thanks, Anthony. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you about uh, an example of what we think is not uh, uh, only precision medicine, but really how you take in an idea, a sort of an aha moment, uh, into all the way to implementation as, as Alan and a Adam showed you, uh, how do you put that into a continuous uh, learning system. We, we, the Precision Medicine Centers of Excellence uh, were born out of uh, Hopkins in Health, which is um, the university-wide uh, program to really enable precision medicine. Uh, we dubbed it in health because we think it's the intelligent use of health information to individualize and integrate health care much more than just personalized medicine or precision medicine. Our three major goals, just to introduce you to this concept of in-health, are to capture clinically relevant and bio biologically anchored subgroups in, in a more intentional way to scale, to use those subgroups to diagnose and treat more efficiently and to, di dis and to discover new mechanisms, and to integrate delivery, discovery and delivery. We really are trying to figure out how to capture OSLER. Uh, you know, how do you capture the best of a clinician and actually make that available to all clinicians and really ask the question, you know, if this is true, what does it imply? We're trying to act on a clinician's moment of wonder, that, into, that leap where they go, huh, what does that mean? How can we actually test that? How can we recognize that there's a subset of people, in our case, men with prostate cancer, who can safely forgo treatment for prostate cancer? How can we utilize measures of disease trajectory to address individual patients' health states? And that, then how do we do, create a learning health environment to reduce uncertainty in patient-physician decisions, not only for the physicians, but for the patients? So here was the, the problem. Prostate cancer incidence uh, increased in the 90s uh, dramatically due to PSA uh, testing. Prostate-specific antigen testing was a blood test that became available in the 90s and says, and by having this test, we were able to find much more prostate cancer that was prevalent in uh, the population. And you saw this huge increase in the incidence of prostate cancer because all of a sudden men were getting a blood test. Uh, the, in fact, instead of one in ten men being risked at the, being di having a risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer, went to one in six. The problem is, is do one in six men really need their prostates removed to avoid harm? In fact, if you, 80% of men age 80 have prostate cancer in the prostate if we do autopsies for other reasons. Clearly, they never knew they had prostate cancer. So, but with the advent of PSA testing, it was assumed that all prostate cancers would eventually progress to a lethal phenotype without treatment. And it was, this, it was also assumed that some prostate cancers would rapidly progress and become in, incurable. And back in the 90s, it was considered heretical not to treat prostate cancer. But we, Bal Carter and others, Pat Walsh, who defined the uh, radical prostatect, the nerve sparing radical re retropubic prostatectomy, really said, wait a minute, 80% of men have prostate cancer in their prostates, what are we finding here? And can we define a favorable subset for targeted management? Could we actually determine which men needed to be treated for prostate cancer versus which men could be actually just followed with active surveillance? So the hypothesis at the time was that we could actually develop predictors of small volume, low grade prostate cancer in prostate biopsies define a subgroup of men thought to harbor these indolent prostate cancers for whom treatment could be avoided, and then track their disease trajectory to determine subgroup behavior and maybe change practice. So um, Dr. Uh, Bal Carter created the active surveillance clinical program at Hopkins as a longitudinal study. You can see this started in 1995 and has now accrued over 1,500 uh, patients and basically created a system where we could follow guys by their PSA, 
their biopsy findings, their disease extent on the biopsies, like how much cancer did you actually see in a biopsy. We en uh, enrolled them in a surveillance program with longitudinal monitoring in an iterative fashion to follow outcomes. And we took then a team science approach to medical decision making with urologists, pathologists, radiologists, um, epidemiologists and biostatisticians, people doing research in the lab, and eventually with the Technology Innovation Center, we created a, 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 a tool and a, actually a program to look at these patients over time. So what did we learn and what have we exported from the active surveillance program? Well, to make a long story short, we found that you could identify men with low-grade small-volume prostate cancers, i.e. those with favorable risk, that would never progress. Those guys are the ones that probably are the ones that are age 80 uh, who have prostate cancer that never needs to be found. In fact, if we can identify these men with favorable risk prostate cancer, they're 24 times more likely to die of a cause other than prostate cancer 15 years after the diagnosis. And in doing this and in operationalizing this precision approach, defining this subgroup, surveillance has increased from less than 10% to 40% from 2005 to 2013. Scott Zeger and Yates Coley and others in the School of uh, Public Health and, and, and our biostatisticians actually took this data and used a Bayesian model based on the accumulated, acu all the accumulated clinical data and pathological data that we had for predicting the true prostate cancer state. What were, wh who were the men that were harboring actually maybe more lethal cancers versus these low-grade cancers? And they created a, uh, a model, which you can see here, that we actually put in men's PSA, their age, uh, whether they've had biopsies over time. And they created a model that shows somebody's likely, PS, likely, likely PSA trajectory over time, their, their, whether they need a biopsy in the future, and what their probability was of having a low-grade or high-grade prostate cancer if they were actually to have a biopsy in the future. What this allowed us to do was actually save guys from getting biopsied again. And we also worked with the Technology Innovation Center and patients to say, how would you like this data presented to you? And so we created uh, apps you know, on, that can be shown on the phone or in the clinic on the computer screen screen to say, gosh, if you're 100 men with your age, your diagnosis, your PSA, and your biopsy history had their prostate surgically removed, what is the chance that, that something bad would be found in that, uh, in that surgical specimen versus if you did nothing? And you, you know, we created graphics like this one to show that actually nobody dies of their prostate cancer and two guys might recur within 15 years. This, and basically, again, what we showed with our patients are more precise ways to show them the data so that they would be able to make good decisions from that. So we've used, this is just one example of what we've done, but it shows you that you can take an observation that, said, uh, um, uh, that started with, huh, do we really need all these, uh, does every man have to have a prostatectomy or radiation therapy, or can we actually spare them those treatments? How do we define that subset? The, that, taking that kind of clinical question that, uh, that was shown, that Dr. Carter and Dr. Wall saw and said, let's define how to do this better, create a longitudinal data set with good data that we could then query, and then actually take it all the way back in an iterative fa pa fashion to the patients. So we've used this as an example uh, to create our Center of Excellence in Prostate Cancer that we believe improves a, the, through patient partnership, a longitudinal specimen and data collection, iterative patient care. Patients can see where they fall on that spectrum. We think that's really important. Thank you.